Hey guys, welcome back, Lingaroo Troop. It's great to have you with me today. Um, I am excited about this community. Um, we're growing by the day and, and every single day I get to interact with you guys via questions or comments or emails and that is the part that keeps this going for me. I, I love that piece. And today's video is not unlike several that we've done recently. Um, this is an actual question that came in from one of you guys and, and because one of you asked me, I'm confident that, that probably others out there have it as well. And it's this idea of auditory processing disorder. It's a term we hear a lot. We hear it kind of thrown out there sometimes. And today we're going to be talking about that. What is auditory processing disorder and what is it not and how to tell the difference? Don't go away. All right, welcome back. So, so yeah, guys, today let's dive into this idea of auditory processing disorder. Um, I will confess to you that even in the field of speech pathology, um, this has been kind of an issue, not an issue, but a question that gets raised um, fairly frequently, right? Because I think it's a term that brings a little bit of confusion, um, especially in, in kind of translating kind of what we know as speech therapists, what we know about language and, and auditory processing and things, um, and, and kind of communicating that in a clear way um, to you guys as parents. So that's my hope today. Um, as always, if you have questions, please put them down in the comments below and don't be shy. As I mentioned, this, this video is coming out of a question you brought to me. So I can only answer the questions that I receive. So if you have a question um, about this topic or any other topic, please contact me, put it down in the comments below or reach out to me on our Facebook page. So, yeah, so this idea of auditory processing, first of all, what is, what is auditory processing? Well, if we break it down, auditory or, or acoustic information or, or an auditory signal that's coming in, going up to our brain, and, and then processing, the way our brain is, is able to, to process what, it's, what the ears have told it that it's heard, right? Um, and, and this is confusing because sometimes it's kind of hard, especially with our kiddos, those kiddos who are already having difficulty with language, and we know that, um, it's kind of hard to, to tweeze out what's what. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, true auditory processing disorder, or sometimes you'll see it as CAPD, central auditory processing disorder. It's, it's the brain's ability to, to distinguish and to decipher auditory signals as they're coming in, right? And so it, it is oftentimes separated from language. And, and it's hard um, to know when, when that is the case. Um, typically, language, kids who are having trouble with language have trouble with what? We've talked about this, concepts. When they're having trouble focusing on, or when they're having trouble following directions, they're having trouble with those, those language concepts, those connectors, right? The, the concepts of location, the concepts of, of time or sequence. So it's a lot of times those connecting pieces, those linguistic or language pieces that our kiddos who have difficulties with language have trouble with. So when they're in the classroom and they didn't follow a direction, sometimes it's just because they didn't understand the language of that direction. Central auditory processing disorder is actually something completely different. Um, central auditory processing disorder or auditory processing can only be diagnosed by an audiologist. It is an actual audiological di difficulty or disorder um, where, where the brain and, and the auditory system are, are kind of uh, reaching a disconnect, right? Or, or there's a breakdown somewhere in that system as it relates to the acoustic signals. Um, most oftentimes, you'll see it play out in, in kind of like a signal to noise ratio. In other words, if I'm sitting in class and my teacher's up at the front and, and between my teacher's auditory signal coming towards my auditory system or my, my hearing and, and my brain in order to process that information, it has to get by 28 other kids. It has to get by the radiator that's whirring kind of quietly over here at the left. 
and it has to get back by Johnny who's tapping his pencil and Susie who's kind of creaking her seat, creak, 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 right? All of this background noise, all of these things that are competing with the teacher's signal. Maybe you remember the, the Charlie Brown, you know, and you, you have this, this signal coming, but as the audience, we never really heard anything that she was saying. And it, it's not necessarily to that extreme, right, for our kiddos, but that's the, that's the idea, that for these children who have true CAPD, Central Auditory Processing Disorder, it is difficult for them to distinguish or to make out the signal, the teacher's voice, as it's coming past all of this and competing with all of this background noise, right? So, so why is this hard for us with our kiddos, again, to distinguish what's what or to tweeze out what is true auditory processing disorder and what is just kind of related to some of these other areas of language? If the teacher gives the direction, okay, kids, you know, take out your book, get out a piece of paper, put your name at the top, um, and then flip the paper over, um, or face down on your desk, right? That was a lot of information, a lot of language, a lot of sequence, what, what you're supposed to do first, then next. Um, and was it that our child had difficulty sequencing that information, understanding the language concept that, of that information, or did he or she just have difficulty distinguishing the signal, what was even being said at all, compared to the background noise, okay? so. Diagnostically, in terms of a diagnosis, again, CAPD can only be diagno diagnosed by an audiologist. Um, it's not something that a school teacher or a speech pathologist or somebody can just say, oh, it's auditory processing. Because again, there's a lot of confusion in what they could mean by that. So if you're concerned about your kiddo having difficulty as it relates to that sound versus the background noise or distinguishing um, the difference in sounds. Another thing you might see is um, difficulty distinguishing between the actual phonemes, right? And we've talked about this in a lot of our videos. Um, we talked about the idea of morphology, right? And how a lot of meaning, if you haven't watched that video, we'll, we'll put the link down below. A lot of meaning in our language is tied to just the littlest of sounds, right? When book becomes books, and now all of a sudden you know you need two books or more than two, right? So if your child, again, think about auditory processing disorder, if they're not distinguishing that they might have missed that whole concept that they were supposed to get more than one, right? So you can see how these little intricacies of, of the auditory processing of the actual auditory signal can affect language, or you could have a child who has difficulty with both Right? They're not picking up on the S, the plural S, and they don't understand plurals to begin with. Right, So there, there are some cases where you have just auditory processing. There are times when you have both difficulty processing the signal and difficulties with language, but then sometimes it's just language for our kiddos. Okay, so again, what can we do, right? Diagnostically, if you're concerned about your child having this true auditory processing difficulty, I would encourage you to ask your PCM um, or to get a referral for an audiologist. And this is a test that most of them can do and they can let you know if it is truly a, a difficulty within the auditory system, um, processing auditory information, okay? But then kind of moving on from that, let's say you go to the audiologist, you get a diagnosis of central auditory processing. There's really nothing we can do that's going to change that difficulty in and of itself, like neurologically. There's really nothing at this stage in the game that we can do that's going to help um, change the, the brain's wiring as it relates to processing this auditory information. However, there are things that we can do environmentally, right? There are modifications that we can make. And again, when you think about what the difficulty is, kind of the signal to noise ratio, um, how could we go ahead and, and modify the environment to help our kiddos? Uh, maybe it's preferential seating. Maybe it's that instead of on the back row, we ask that the teacher put them front and center, right in front of where he or she often teaches, so that there's less distraction, there's less auditory um, interference with the signal um, before it gets to your child. 
Um, another way to do this is through um, an FM system. A lot of school systems have these. You may have seen these before. It's a little speaker that sits right on the child's desk and the teacher actually wears some type of a, an amplifier or a, a microphone so that they're speaking right into the microphone and it's going to the child's desk. And again, it's, it's amplifying that signal up and hopefully over the background noise. Other things that you can do would be to um, ask your teacher or, or the IEP staff, if your child's on an IEP, what can we do, um, especially as, as it relates to testing situations or, or spelling tests, things like that, where, where there's an auditory signal being put out and the child has to manipulate it or do something with the signal, whether it's copy a dictation or, or writing spelling words, right? Those are situations where it might be better and easier for your child to be alone in a room, a quiet place where it's just the child and just the teacher and so that there's not so much competition, um, again, reducing that signal to noise ratio. And so I would, I would argue here, as we're thinking about CAPD, I would argue that yes, it's a good piece of the puzzle sometimes to have, to understand like, is this you know, something as we're, as we're trying to figure out the difficulties our kiddos are having and as parents, as mamas and daddies, we wanna, we wanna do the most we can to help our kiddos, right? That's our goal in life. So um, as we think about this, is this something, is, this, is there something to this CAPD thing for my child? Um, possibly. I actually had my child, diag or not diagnosed, uh, I had my child evaluated for this particular thing um, because she was, he, she was repeating words incorrectly to me. I would say something, I'd say, go get the, you know, go get, go get my telephone or something. And she would say, what's a, what's a smell -a -thone? Or something like it was just like you know she would she would repeat these words back to me and and she her her processing of my phonemes or my sounds um, wasn't correct and I, I was like what is going on right um, so we actually had her evaluated for this um, it didn't really change anything though that we did with her um, I had already asked for preferential seating I had already asked for some of these modifications to be put in place. Um, so that with or without this diagnosis, uh, we, could, we could kind of try to rule some of these other things out um, and, and to see if they helped. So um, I, I would say go ahead and go and, and, and get the diagnosis if you're concerned or, or at least the diagnostic testing done if you're concerned. Um, but maybe see if you can try some of these modifications in the meantime and um, see if they help. See if they, they help your child uh, feel more focused and, and, and if, they, um, if your child's able to better attend to the directions and, and to the things that the teacher or, or whoever the speaker is saying um, and, and just to see if it helps. And then of course, if, if you rule that out, or even if you don't rule that out, if you, if you find out that yes, that is an issue, you also wanna look again at this receptive language piece, right? Um, if your child isn't involved or it isn't currently in speech language therapy, I would suggest that highly um, to get them evaluated. Watch some of the other videos on this channel. Um, shoot me questions as you have them. But you know, that language piece could also be part of the problem. And, and there's a lot that we can do in speech therapy to, to help teach some of those concepts, those concepts of location, of time, of sequence, of, of number, right? And so all of those things that are important for following directions, things that are important, uh, teaching comprehension markers, right? That when a, when a child hears who, they automatically, okay, that's gonna be a person. Right? And, and, and working on some of those receptive language tasks um, can, can help to boost your child's understanding, uh, whether it's at home or in the classroom. So guys, I hope this has been helpful. I hope that you've kind of been able to clear a little bit up of the muddied waters here between the differences of, of central auditory processing disorder and um, just receptive language difficulties. And as I said, if, if you have follow-on questions, please shoot them at me. If you have um, other questions about other topics, please, please, please. Um, engage with this community. I'm, I'm loving it. So um, if you haven't already, subscribe here. We're going to be we're going to be rolling out a lot of content over the next few weeks and you're not going to want to miss a thing. And then, then as always, check out these other videos over here and we'll see you next time at Lingaroo, where language comes to life. <laughs>